Okay, on to item number 10, preschool update. And let's see, I believe we have, do we, are we turning to a senior staff member? I've got Jared Lisenby, preschool specialist, Christina Barrera, preschool specialist, and Chelsea Oaks, special ed preschool specialist. Thank you for joining us. This is an information item, board members. If you want your mic turned on, you'll have to press the button with the little guy on it. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, Board Chair Moss and members of the board. Good afternoon. Let's let's call to order. Okay. Yeah, sorry. We're we're just sure. using your coming up as a chance to take a quick break here. But we Absolutely. wanna we do want to pay attention. Let's make sure we're focused on you. No, we were just doing some chatting. We can take a break after this though, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Duly noted, request for break. We got our preschool specialists and then we will take a break. So Thank you for joining us. It's all yours. Excellent. All right. Well, good afternoon, Board Chair Moss and members of the board. My name is Christina Barrera, and I am currently a preschool specialist here at USBE. We very much appreciate the opportunity to share with you an academic highlight for preschool today. And of course, thank you for your time. I'd now like to take a minute to introduce you to our team, which also includes my colleagues Jared Lisenby and Chelsea Oaks. To share a little bit about me, I started teaching in a pre-K pre classroom back in 2004, eventually becoming the director of a local early childhood center uh, before coming here to USBE. Now, Jared. And I'm Jared Lisenby. Um, I'm one of the preschool education specialists here at USBE. I've been here for three years now. And I am Chelsea Oaks, the special education preschool specialist. Previously, I was an early learning preschool specialist in teaching and learning for two years. And then just in August, I switched to the special education. All right, so just as a reminder, there is a federal requirement for school districts to provide special education services to children from three to 21 years old. Um, that is the IDEA. And um, as part of this requirement, a continuum of services is required to serve students with disabilities. This continuum includes a general education classroom, which is an inclusive setting with at least half of the students in the classroom being children who are typically developing. Uh, so for preschool, that means they, they can use special education funding if it's available. They can also use Title I funding, or they may have a tuition-based community preschool uh, within the school district. And in addition to special education preschool, uh, we also have the high quality school readiness grants. Just a little bit of background on this. I'll talk about this in, more in a moment. Um, but um, access to high quality early learning programs have been identified as one of the key um, interventions for intergenerational poverty. Um, so providing access to at risk students to maximize their learning is a key component of what we do with, with preschool. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be speaking to you about the benefits of high quality preschool programs, which include learning foundations, family choice, and support for teaching and learning. Part of what we do as preschool education specialists is to provide professional learning and support to do um, support to programs to help them meet the elements of high quality school readiness initiative uh, set out in legislation, which I'll be talking about in a few slides. Now I'd like to turn things back over to Jared. 
So just a little bit of background and context. Um, this slide shows the, the patterns in preschool enrollment in LEAs over the last five years. Um, we had a high of 16,844 in 2020, um, the year before COVID hit, or I guess the year that COVID hit, um, which then dropped the numbers quite substantially. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that over the last three years, though, we've recovered, and so we're almost, with last year, we're almost back up to the point where we were um, prior to the pandemic. Um, as part of the school, okay, so just really briefly here, this also breaks out the number, the, the number of students who are in special education services, that's the bottom purplish bar, um, the number of students in charter school, charter school preschools, which is the middle orange bar, and then the rest is students who are in um, community, community preschool services or Title I or part of the school readiness grants. Um, we have two school readiness grants that we help administer in coordination with Department of Workforce Services Office of Child Care. Um, this, just a, a really brief background here, um, this coming legislative session will be the 10-year mark from the original House Bill 96, which established um, high-quality school readiness programs here in the state, um, which was initially the Pay for Success grants. Um, in 2019, these grants were expanded and combined into a, a single high-quality school readiness grant program consisting of two different grants. Um, the first one is the Becoming High Quality Grants, which provides funding for programs specifically to invest in quality, such as um, materials, coaching, professional learning. Um, the second grant here, the Expanded Student Access Grant, actually provides funding for programs who qualify as high quality um, to, to provide seats for eligible students. Um, eligible students mean students who are um, low income with at least one risk factor in foster care or students whose home language is something other than English. Um, so part of what we do is that high quality component. We know that high quality really does matter. Um, this slide shows, you know, as, as we've been working with programs on the grants, uh, we've seen some tremendous increase in the quality in programs over the last few years. Um, this just illustrates from two years ago to last year, um, the little bit of background here, this is the measure of classroom quality for, called the, environment, the Early Childhood Envi Environmental Rating Scale or ECHRs. Um, this is a seven-point scale. Um, scores of five or above are considered high quality. Um, as you can see here, um, programs are scoring in the high quality range in two of the three components that are reported to the School <laughs> Readiness Board governing the grant. Um, those are the language and literacy area and interactions. And we're almost there. Um, we're pretty close in the overall ECHRs score. Uh, so exciting things are happening with quality in the School Readiness programs. And I'm going to pass it over to Christina mm -hmm. to talk a little, about, a little bit about the elements of high quality, which we've used for, to support those. Mm -hmm. And just as a reminder, if you need access to these links, uh, staff will be providing you with these slides uh, shortly so you can access them for further information. So taking a look here, uh, we've indicated which uh, code contains the elements of a high quality school readiness program. Um, those elements include curriculum aligned with the Utah core state standards for early learning for ages three to five, professional learning, ongoing assessment including school readiness, a maximum class size of 20 students with two staff members or a one to 10 ratio, ongoing program evaluation, family engagement, lead teacher qualification requirements, and a kindergarten transition plan. Ultimately, we are focused on student learning and success, so you may be wondering how these elements of high quality relate to student outcomes. My colleague Jared will now share information with you regarding those. So, yeah, so ultimately, as Christina was saying, it's all about the students, all about helping support them to maximize their learning. Um, so this, this graph here shows data from the last three years, um, looking at the, the beginning of the year assessment, showing the percentage of students who are proficient in literacy, um, and then the end of the year. And you can see here we have about a 40% increase in the, the, the percentage of students meeting proficiency standards from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And also, um, you'll also notice that this, this trend is increasing over the last three years. So this past year, 72% of the students who, who took this end of the year assessment going through the high quality school readiness programs met proficiency standards in literacy. Uh, we have a, a similar pattern in numeracy um, with 75% of students at the end of the year meeting proficiency standards um, in, in the numeracy area. Um, so with this, 
we're curious about, you know, since we're as program administrators, we're responsible for encouraging building quality. Uh, we're very interested in looking at, well, what elements of quality, what aspects of quality are most related to child outcomes? Um, so this graph here shows the correlations between um, several areas of the, the Eckers um, classroom quality observation tool um, with child measures, or child measures on the beginning of the year literacy and numeracy and the end of the year literacy and numeracy. Um, so you'll see here, as you would expect, the, in the, the first column or beginning of the year literacy, there is no association, as one would expect, that there's not been any intervention, the children haven't been in the classroom, there wouldn't be expected to be any, any associations. Uh, but at the end of the year, we see some interesting things as far as what aspects of quality correspond with increases. Um, one of the first things is what's not associated. Um, that's the language and literacy component. There's no association between language and literacy um, on the, the classroom quality score and children's outcomes in language and literacy at the end of the year. What is associated is the interaction score and the program structure score. Um, these two scores here are related to the, the quality of the interactions that the teachers have with the students, um, with the interaction score. The second one is the, the program structure score, which takes into account learning in small groups, uh, large groups, and one-on-one um, -on -one interactions during child-directed free play. Uh, in the Eckers tool to score high on this one, um, programs need to have at least one hour during a three-hour period where it's child-directed, teacher-guided, um, play-based learning. And we have some, some research, 20 years of research on um, literacy development in early learning that really shows that children do not do well with whole group direct instruction types of activities where the real learning takes place is in these quality one-on-one -on -one interactions or in small group interactions. Um, so we have a, a little example, and we'll cross our fingers here that this little video plays, um, just to illustrate what these high quality teacher child interactions during play based learning would look like. I help you use those scissors. Watch. Well, put your thumb in the top part of the scissor. Oh, wait. Let's. I think you're. This is going to use this hand. There you go. Your fingers in there. Go open. Close. Open. You can throw that pencil away. All right. Are you ready? I'll hold the paper for you. Okay. There you go. Open. Close. Open. Close. Oh, you cut your vulture in half. Two halves. You put it back together. Two halves. We go home. Okay, so there's a lot of exciting learning that's taking place in that just short little interaction. Um, positive guidance, recognizing the child's need, recognizing what the child's goal is, um, supporting the child, you know, explicit instruction in how to hold the scissors to cut, um, bringing in language, you know, you cut your buzzard in half, um, the half and the whole teaching mathematical skills all in that one little, one, that one little interaction. Um, these are the types of interactions that really do um, coordinate or asso are associated with that learning that we've we've been able to see. Um, I have another little clip here, another brief clip, really showing examples of this learning taking place in the preschool classroom. Um, this this is in the same classroom. They were doing a study on desert habitats, and this child wanted to talk me through a <laughs> diorama of what they have been learning about um, deserts. <laughs> So there's flowers in the desert and camels? Yeah. And leaves and snakes. Snakes. So so where's the water? Water? Yeah, where's the water? There's no water in the desert. There's no water in the desert. So what do the camels and the snakes do? Yeah, they dig up to get to the water, um, which was really cute. You know, but 
yeah, just seeing the excitement and seeing her talk through, you know, the, you know, describing the different parts, um, different aspects of the desert. Um, it's just, it's just so exciting to see how, how engaged the children were in this learning and the learning that takes place. Um, and an interaction like this, you know, um, there's a lot of showing what the child knows that takes place here, um, but also uh, the teacher can recognize there. It's like, okay, she understands some of the idea of like digging down to get water. Uh, we need to expand this in future lessons or, or future, you know, books that we read to talk more about water in the desert because that's an important component. Um, anyways, just I just get excited about <laughs> learning in preschool. Sorry. Um, so with that. All right. So the staff at the State Board of Education strive to support all early learners by providing a strong foundation that will help children love to learn. We also celebrate the successes of children and educators in preschool for all of the hard work that they do. We have a monthly early educator spotlight where we highlight a preschool educator who has been nominated by a peer. And as you can see, uh, also part of ongoing support is for building quality and capacity in early learning programs. Um, that is included in strategy 1C. Uh, this is 1C of the strategic goal number one for early learning. And the goal is for 1C to increase optional access to high quality preschool programs. And so we are thrilled to be continuing uh, that effort and supporting programs to provide that. And also part of this is just raising awareness of the importance and the excitement of early learning, um, especially supporting parents and families, uh, recognizing that parents are children's first and most important teachers. Um, part of what we do also is with the, aligned with the, strategic, the USBE strategic plan area 1D, which is increasing family engagement in early learning. Um, some of the video examples that I had there were part of the, the process or part of the, the task that we have to help spread the word um, so that parents can recognize ideas that they can use with their, their youngest learners um, to support learning both at home and in the preschool classroom if that's something that, that the parents choose to engage in. And with that, that concludes our report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Comments, questions? From board members, we've got member Bogus, member Klein, member Strait, and Hymas. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. I, stars Bogus. <laughs> I don't know who is first. It looks like member Klein might have been had the first light. So let's start there. Um, what is the t uh, average student teacher ratio in the preschool classes? So in, for the high quality school readiness grants, there's a requirement for one adult for 10 students. And so the maximum and with a, a cap of 20 to you know, 20 um, children in the class. So it's a one to 10 ratio um, because of um, the nature of the early childhood education in the um, in the LEAs, you know, being very closely tied to special education, um, most times there's more than just the two teachers in the classroom to support that learning. So there's always two teachers, if or if there's up to 20, then there's two teachers. Right, with a 1 to 10 ratio, um, yes. Okay, and, and are these classes in the, are they at the local schools, like the regular schools, or are they different buildings? Um, yes, most of these classrooms in district preschools are in the elementary schools. Uh, we do have some programs that have um, early learning centers where they, where they will have multiple um, preschool classrooms in one <laughs> building. But yes, most of these preschool classrooms are in elementary school buildings to yeah. help with that continuity into um, the K through the kindergarten system. Okay. And um, what kind of technology is, do the kids use? Um, that varies by the program because of the, with the, the high quality school readiness grant, the Eckers observations um, emphasizes very limited use of technology in the classroom. Um, technology is usually limited to you know, less than you know, five to 10 minutes per child and if it's used at all. In most of the classrooms, recognizing that the, the highest quality um, learning takes place in these one-on-one -on -one personal interactions with the teachers, um, most of the classrooms we observe 
only use media as part of perhaps a whole group activity where they're they're doing a um, you know an active song or something where they'll they'll use that media. Um, but other than that, the primary mode of, of um, instruction is these one-on-one -on -one interactions or small group interactions. Okay, and then standards are there standards for pre-K? Um, the State Board of Education has approved the standards for um, early learning for um, ages three through five. So yes, there are standards approved by the board. Okay, so I was just having a conversation um, uh, with Deputy uh, Superintendent Stallings this week, and um, I asked, you know, if something about pre-K, and she said it's not part of the public education system. So I asked why we why we administer these programs, and she said it was a directive of the legislature. So while it's not part of the public education system, we still manage the program, it sounds like. So part of this... So uh, I'm just looking... I, I just think if someone can speak to that, I'd appreciate it, because it sounds like it's part of the public education system, especially when we have standards for it. So maybe you're not the one to a answer that, but... Deputy Superintendent. Or deputy superintendent Dixon. Most days I'm a deputy. No, here we got you. <laughs> yeah, just if I may, uh, Mr. Well, Chair, to the uh, to Board Member Klein, uh, the what we mean what we mean when we say it's not part of the public education system, it's not part of the constitutional oversight, which is K-12. We are we are a K-12 public system, which is unusual. Most states are pre-K-12, and some are pre-K-12 and beyond that a Board of Education has oversight for. So it's, what is your jurisdiction? It's generally K-12, even though we've had programs assigned to us. So it's part of, it's always been part of the public education system, but not part of the codified K-12. We're not a pk 12 so, we're K-12 under your jurisdiction. May I? It, it sounds to me sure. like this is a distinction without a difference. Yeah. We're still, like the, con but which would mean that we are in violation of the Constitution. If the Constitution says we're K-12, and yet we run pre-K. If I may, sir, sure. as, as designated in code. So in code, we are, we are designated to be part of this um, high-quality preschool program in concert with Department of Workforce Services. So code is out of alignment with Constitution. No, it's about your role... Uh, what you have oversight, K-12 is listed, and preschool is listed as a separate program. And it names you in code as a partner with DWS to oversee this program. Uh, again, I think a okay. distinction without a difference. Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Three. Three. Hi, so again, Chelsea Oak, Special Education Preschool Specialist. Uh, we do have the federal mandate to provide special education services to preschool age students. So, I, and again, part for, for students with disabilities, correct? Yes, thank you. All right, I think uh, Member Hymas. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I'm grateful for the presentation, um, for the things that you've shared. I see kindergartners coming in every year. Uh, I love seeing them learn about art and deserts. What are we doing about math and reading, right? What are we expecting our pre-K to know by the time they hit kindergarten? How many digits should they know? Should they be able to add or subtract those digits? How many words, uh, letters should they read? I just heard there's a document, but can you just quickly, like what in, in your ideal uh, kindergartner, this is what you guys have prepared them for. What does that look like? As far as just math and reading, just briefly, if you could. Okay, um, to respond, um, there is the PEEP, the Preschool Entry and Exit Profile Assessment that is aligned to the early learning standards, um, which provides those expectations. That's the, the data that I was showing as far as proficiency. Um, and, you know, with that, there's, there's some theories from early learning, not theories, but some practice from early learning that talks about um, a child entering or leaving the preschool program would be expected to know a certain number of uppercase and lowercase letters, um, be able to count. Um, but what we're finding as far as what's most predictive of student success 
isn't necessarily the letters and numbers known. It's more that foundational lifelong learning practices, the love of learning, um, the ability to be self-directed learners, um, which is carrying them forward more um, more successfully. Um, so yes, while there is, you know, there is a, a theoretical number, like a student should know 18 uppercase letters and you know 15 lowercase letters, um, that's not the most important thing that we're finding as far as predicting success as they're entering kindergarten. Follow up? You bet. I mean, that's, that's interesting. I just, but by the time they're in third grade, first grade, second grade, whatever, we want them reading on a grade level. I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm confused by this and maybe I can have this conversation offline with, with some of the staff, but it uh, seems to me if we're shooting for expectations of our LEAs, then our pre-K would align more with what expectations we're holding them to, if that makes sense. And this is, this is just a query. This is, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. I, uh, again, I'm, I just use the term query because I heard it today from my seatmate. I've never used that before. Anyway, um, I, I appreciate um, your, your thoughts here and what you're doing. I just, uh, you know, when they come into my school, I want to know that they can do specific things during, uh, in kindergarten. And I see that as a success measure, um, as well as a love of learning, of course. So th thank you. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, Member Bogus. Thank you, sir. I actually did have a question, and I apologize. So the first one is, I would love a copy of your slideshow. I don't see it in backup. But did I hear you use the language um, multilingual or second language interventions? Did I hear that? Or did I make that up in my head when you said something else? Um, may I respond? Yes, please. Um, I did not say that. Oh. <laughs> what I did say was, um, as far as the school readiness grant programs, um, as far as qualifying to receive funding for the seats, um, the qualification is low income with at least one risk factor, foster care, or a child from a family whose home language is something other than English. Okay, so we don't have a federal mandate to pre-K second language learners, we have a federal mandate to pre-K in the, the special education realm. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and I appreciate that you, you clarified that because I, I guess to me, second language learning is, is not a disability. And so I appreciate that clarity um, for, for us and, and for, our, for our public at large that that we honor that they're just learning, they just have two languages. So thank you, sir. And that slideshow is in your email just now. Yep. Can I make a comment? Yes, Member Green. Yeah, I just wanna say thank you for this presentation that you put together and, and for the, even the videos that you showcased. I think it really highlights the innocence and the age that those young children are and the joy. There's a sparkle in the corner of their eye that you can see, and that makes a lifelong learner. That makes these kids excited to go to school. I've seen some shifts, you know, with some of that, what I call magic kind of extracted out of these young learners um, environments, kind of from like older teachers, um, a lot of which are retiring, but they would, they would bring in the music, they bring in the routine, They'd bring in the nursery rhymes. They'd bring in all of this, um, I guess, age appropriate or level, you know, learning at that level that gets those kids engaged. The little girl highlighting those environment, you know, with the cactus and where does it get to walk? You, you saw it ended with her looking. I mean, she's tearing apart that diagram with her eyes trying to search for the answer for that. And so I just want to encourage that type of learning for these young kids you know, being able to um, cut your paper, all of these things I call the intangibles. So, and I think it's age appropriate. And I do think that it creates a foundation for um, quality academic learners in the future, because we've, we've kept in mind what age we're at and developing the skill sets that they should be developing in. So thank you for making those highlights in your presentation. Thank you, Member Green. Member Strait? Yes, thank you. A quick question, Chair. Uh, in regards to uh, certification, 
I know in, in Utah, certification with a bachelor's degree is not required in early childhood education. Uh, do we have any data on if there is any impact on certification for uh, preschool as far as the success? Thank you. Go ahead, thanks. So um, on a larger level, you know, nationwide, there is, with the data that we have, um, looking at, you know, because I was looking at the elements, you know, aspects that predicted child, both classroom quality and child outcomes, um, what we found was that having specific training in early childhood education, um, whether it's through a, a training program at a high, institute of higher education or through the, the CDA, the Child Development Associate Program, is associated with higher quality in the classroom. Um, there's, you know, so I guess that's the, the brief answer that yes, there is. Um, it's obviously a lot more complicated than that because it does tend to be specifically related to training in child development and um, early childhood education instruction practices in these high quality one on one interactions and small group interactions. Um, I would love to have further discussion with you on this, but, you know, because it is kind of complex because there's a lot of things that come into play with that. But you are correct that right now there is not a, a state requirement for certification for early for preschool teachers other than in special education. Okay, Member Wood. Thank you. I I just wanted to say thank you. Having a, a daycare director in my home um, I've watched her interactions as she's had to work with your office to get the PEEP established in her care center. And uh, I asked her, I told her when when this was on the agenda, I, I asked her what her thoughts were. And one of the things she talked about is how much the PEEP has improved the quality of the care in her center um, because they, they did the, the, the pre-entry exam and that gave direction for her teachers to move ahead. And so thank you for the work you do for even these community centers to help bring quality care to our, our young ones. Vice Chair Earl. Yeah, just a comment. I just piggybacking off a little bit off of what Board Member Hyman said. Um, I actually appreciate the play more than the academics at that age. Now that may go against, I know, <laughs> because I think, oh, and I think you can do both. That's the high quality, right? That's the difference there is the high quality. But I, I, I also wouldn't want us to overemphasize academics when kids are just learning to write, develop these fine motor skills and develop this. Um, and that that language, how important that is at that age. So while I, I do agree with that, I, that careful balance is there so that children can be children, right? And they can love it and just enjoy and, and then move into the more academics as they get older. But, you know, childhood, we don't want to, we don't want to skip it right kids need that they need that it's it's an important resiliency thing so anyways that just piggybacking on a positive way right with the academics so okay thank you all right seeing no other lights thank you very much for the preparation the slides and i did see that was circulated right is that what we saw <laughs> so this the slide deck's now been circulated with the data impressive data in there thank you for sharing um thank you for being with us appreciate it we do a clap? All right. What's that? I think we did. Oh, we did. Oh, sorry, sorry. We'll do another clap. You bet. The I didn't know we did. Double clap. Did I miss the? I think we did. What's that? And for the. All right. Let's see. We're on to general session legislation preparation. Oh, I'm sorry. We are on a five minute break. We are teed up to come back at 530. So I mean, let's count at six. As long as you doesn't think that's too much fun. I mean, I'd like to. Ah. <laughs> I mean, just saying. Let's, like let's yeah, stay on course get here. Back to academics. Academic progression yeah, is mean, at stake. <laughs> Matt? I mean, 